Okay. So we are reading from, for those who don't know, we're reading from uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's anthology uh, that's called Social and Communal Harmony. So it's an anthology of uh, discourses from the Buddhist teachings. And we are on the section on the intentional community. So we are up to on page 115. Four means of embracing others. Aha. Yes. Okay. Monks, there are these four means of embracing others. What for? Giving, endearing speech, beneficent conduct, and impartiality. These are the four means of embracing others. Mm. Giving, endearing speech, beneficent conduct, and impartiality under diverse worldly conditions as is suitable to fit each case. These means of embracing others are like the linchpin of a rolling chariot. If there were no such means of embracing others, neither mother nor father would be able to obtain esteem and veneration from their own from their son. But these means of embracing exist, and therefore the wise respect them. Thus they attain to greatness and are highly praised. Wow. <laughs> What do you think, Vinayal Chandra? I think that I'm not taking it in, so I think you better say something. <laughs> yeah, okay. My brain has got fused. <laughs> okay, I'll read it again. Okay, I'll read it again. Monks, there are these four means of embracing others. What for? Giving. Endearing speech. Beneficent conduct and impartiality. These are the four means of embracing others. Giving, endearing speech, beneficent conduct and impartiality under diverse worldly conditions as is suitable to fit each case these means of embracing others are like the linchpin of a rolling chariot. If there were no such means of embracing others, neither mother nor father would be able to obtain esteem and veneration from their son. But these means of embracing exist and therefore the wise respect them. Thus they attain to greatness and are highly praised. Yeah. So we have so many ways of relating to, to bosses, to colleagues, to parents, you know, and often it's just business, isn't it? You want to, you know, this is what I need. You, I'll tell you and you tell me what I need. And okay, uh, we've done a, that transaction. <laughs> and uh, thanks very much, put down the phone, you know. But, uh, and our whole life seems to be, we, you know, get this done, get that done. Mm. And we finished all our business for today. And therefore we have now embraced each other. <laughs> <laughs> and that. Uh, and finished for the day. Even if your own family and children is like, did you do that? 
Yeah. yeah. You brush your teeth. <laughs> but uh, we forget that that is actually not what it means to be with other people. Mm -hmm. To be with other people is not a, it's not a, it's not a business transaction. It is, um, what do we, oh, what do we give? What do we give? And we give of ourselves, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We give of ourselves. Um, but yeah, so, um, and it, uh, so giving endearing speech, mm -hmm. endearing speech. Like I said, often we have, uh, you know, we just want to get the job done. But um, how do we do it? How do we do it? We come from that heart of, um, of uh, you know, how is my speech a gift? Even if it is just yeah. to someone on the phone or, a, or a, um, uh, you know, someone in the shop. Is my speech a gift to somebody? It makes you happy, doesn't it? It's not just because I've been on the phone the the last couple of days, finding venues for Ajahn Brahm's talk for Ajahn Brahm's retreat, and you can really get into. Okay, thanks. Okay, 150 people. Yep, you don't have a room. Thanks, bye. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, your speech is a gift. Your speech is a gift. Um, what do people think? Mm. Hey, is someone yeah. going to ask them to unmute or shall I do? Sarah, can I ask Ramut, please? You should be able to unmute, Sarah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to speak or? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, what if it's a situation where you've got to give quite negative feedback? Um, because it's hard, especially in the moment, um, you know, because I've had a situation just recently, well, two situations, I mean, one with the police um, over a situation where, I mean, it wasn't, you know, it was very, very much, some, well, I mean, it depends how you see mine, but somebody had threatened to punch me in the face and the police came round and he said, well, you know, I didn't get this case until a month after the event and I couldn't do anything. And obviously, you know, I wasn't happy because it was in a Chinese and there was video recording. Da, 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 da. Um, and it's just very hard because my understanding is, is that Buddhism isn't just all about giving lovely, positive feedback. Sometimes um, we have to give feedback that's critical and actually that is beneficial. Um, but I suppose, how would you save the person's face if you see what I mean? Very hard. I'm bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> I have lots of theories. <laughs> What's your theory? <laughs> um, how does it work in reality? In reality, is I avoid the situation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have I have the theory. The theory is that I think that uh, well, may I come from a place that is not of blaming, but um, um, out of compassion. That that person is also in a in a, 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 a confused, you know. I as just as I am, that person also is deluded. Um, they probably, you know, don't really know what they're doing, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and and if I if I, I go, here is someone equally confused. How can I speak to someone who who is who is um, who does who who is in pain really? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I really do try and change my mind from one of criticalness to one of um, compassion because all of us are deluded to all of us are deluded. So we all do things that are not right to a greater or lesser degree. So bearing that in mind, I cannot expect everyone to behave according to the rule book 
my rule book. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's really helpful. It's really helpful to to train my own mind to um, uh, to to um, to to train my own mind to have compassion. Yeah. It's it's a it's it's a uh, it's it doesn't come automatically. What comes automatically is how come they're not doing that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you can you hear me still. Yeah, yeah. um, it's just in the moment, you know, sort of in the because I don't. It's sort of just recently I've sort of been much more shoot from the hip rather than be, you know, sort of gentle sort of response you know so I had a new television delivered and very patronizing young man and it's just very hard because you want to stop them in the moment because they're talking to you you know as you though you're stupid and you don't know anything about your tv that you've just spent hours researching before you bought it and it's just very difficult you know and I but I just have to try and remember that is that something meditation can teach us you know yeah, it is. Well, I have certain rules of thumb. Like, if I'm feeling a bit, a bit agitated, my rule of thumb is don't say anything. You know. Yeah. yeah. I've I kind of train. I've kind of for good or for bad. Maybe I should say things when I shouldn't say things. But my my kind of uh, rule of thumb is if feeling odd, say nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. but then what happens later I'm sorry because I'm sort of taking up a lot of stuff but what happens then later when it's still going round in your mind um, you know but it's unresolved um, so I felt you know by just not letting this man sort of well I mean really he's a young lad walk all over me um, you know um, I sort of felt you know, I didn't feel so disturbed later, if you see what I mean. Right, 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 right. right. Well, we all have ways of dealing with it. Mine is not particularly skillful, I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, I generally don't say anything, maybe when I should, but I'm, and then it, it goes around in my head, but I kind of feel that that is better than having let, bad words out of my mouth and then yeah. hurt other people you know I can't take them back yeah um, and it hasn't yeah I can't take them back um, so so for good or for bad uh, I prefer to slowly the pain of working through it myself and and becoming you know it may go around with my in my head I may talk to somebody about it, but rather than that uh, bad word come out in the heat of the moment, that's um, that's 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 my unenlightened strategy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, what would you say? That's great. I think we oh. should um, get to Emily. Uh. Emily, can I ask you to unmute, please? I really am curious about the word endearing, and I really like that word. And it seems different to me than saying, um, I actually forget it was endearing speech, endearing words. I, I forget exactly how it was written, but it seems different to me than maybe the word kind words or kind speech or right words or right speech. And I like the word endearing because I'll often use the word sweetheart, dear, love. And I was just in your part of the world. I was just in the UK last week and they throw out all sorts of like <laughs> petal, flower. <laughs> duck. Did you hear duck? <laughs> duck. Duck. duck? Duck. That's in the north. It means duck, like a duck. Oh, I love it. I'm going to add it to all right, duck. All right, love. So I, so anyway, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if that endearing is placed in there for a particular sense because when I hear endearing it's really allowing that person to know that you have taken them 
in your heart almost. It's almost a little different than just kind because you can be kind, but endearing to me means, okay, where you've just, you've just touched my heart. I've just touched your heart. So I'm just wondering about that. You mean the difference between kind and endearing, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. the kind and endearing yeah it's 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 interesting that that is those are that's that's what the buddha says that it is uh, not just uh you know okay speech you know, i didn't say anything bad but it is endearing speech yeah so um yeah yeah not just kind of neutral i said mute something neutral but i said something endearing yeah, I actually wonder if this is related to the sandwich method <laughs> that um, we try to kind of find a point of commonality first with a person and that this is important, even if we do have to give uh, feedback that might not be necessarily easy for the person to hear. But we first try to endear them to us or ourselves to them to show them that we're on the same page. We care for them. Mm -hmm. We actually care for them. We respect them. They're human beings like ours. You know, we're not so different. Like you were saying, you know, we all have delusion. We all do the wrong things sometimes. We all speak mm -hmm. out of turn or rudely in some situations. So is that, I wonder if it's like bringing them on board, kind of focusing on that commonality you know the shared humanity our shared flaws maybe even before then saying and in this situation when this happens it's actually quite hard for me sometimes and I'm sure that I do that too but you know in this particular situation it was not easy to hear this or whatever it is you might want to tell that person you first kind of rather than starting off from a, div a division mm -hmm. whether it's in our mind or in reality mm -hmm. we sort of bring them in so I wonder if that's related in a way to um, mm. to uh, yeah to giving feedback. Mm. Yeah, yeah, mm. that we're in this together. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's not it's not your wrong, right? And I'm right, right? Because kind can you, still be at a distance, can't yeah. it? Yeah, kindness yeah. can be just a manner, yeah. but endearing is more like mm. yeah, we're in it together. That's a nice way to say it. Mm. Yeah, if that makes sense. But the sandwich method, just to elaborate, is um, maybe helpful for Sarah too, is that, you know, we do have to say, and I think, you know, maybe both of us actually are similar, that we struggle to sometimes yeah, yeah, give yeah, 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 the yeah. difficult feedback. Yeah, yeah. But it's actually important to do it out of compassion, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that compassion has to feel good. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes we have to be compassionate by saying, you know, when you act this way, it's actually harmful, it hurts people um, mm -hmm. or hurt me. Um, but the way to do it is to first note the positive things in that person, give them some positive feedback, you know, endear them in a sense so that they feel, you know, you're seeing them as a whole person. And then you give a little bit, just a tiny, tiny bit of something like a, a critical feedback. And then again, say, but, you know, I can really see you're trying and it's not a big thing. Mm. Um, and again, these are the qualities I see because um, research has shown that it takes about, I think 30 seconds for anything positive, any positive feedback to actually go in. And most of the time, if you try and give people positive feedback, they immediately say, no, no, no. <laughs> they actually reject it immediately. Oh no, no, it's you or it's no, it was nothing. You know, it's our habit. Um, but negative feedback goes in instantly. It's like one second, mm. two seconds. Even if it's positive, we take it as negative sometimes. Mm. <laughs> so, um, so just make that one small. But first of all, you know, be friendly mm. to the person so they don't feel defensive because then it doesn't help anyone, right? I mean, if they're feeling defensive, they just blame you for being a grumpy old what's it or a young what's it. And it doesn't help. Mm. Do you want to read that question? Okay. Is knowing your audience a knower of the world so to be effective? A knower of the world so to be effective. I'm not what sure I understand that question. But, um, do, you, do you want to... Um, Does it say no of the world here? Um, no, it doesn't. We had the... I guess that's one no, of the qualities no of the Buddha. Of the so world. maybe they're saying... Do you, want to, do you want to speak? To put that question... 
so we can really be sure we understand you. I think, I mean, I think, I guess what you said, you don't have to, but, uh, okay. Uh, what are some concrete? That's another question. That's another question. Um, so I think what you're saying probably is that if we understand the people who we're speaking to, we might understand how to address them most effectively. I mean, obviously, we can't always understand that if we've just met somebody, but certainly, you know, once we actually enter relationships with people and we start to know their kind of uh, tendencies, the way that they like to be spoken to or not, or, you know, whether they're tired or not, et cetera, then yeah, definitely, because the Buddha's all about kind of not only where you're coming from but is that person in a in the right state of mind to receive whatever you want to mm -hmm. say so one of the factors of right speech like of mm -hmm. time of, of mm -hmm. you know one of the things to consider before speaking is whether the speech is timely mm -hmm. or not yeah so that can be timely for that other person are they mm -hmm. in the right mood is it confidential do they feel exposed are they already overwhelmed have they already received lots of criticism that day um yeah and how to go about that so definitely that will be part of it mm. i just want to mention there are these four things that the buddha mentioned mm. uh, said about uh right speech mm. um, one was is it the right time mm. and another one was did you get the facts right mm -hmm. did you get the facts right so sometimes we actually um think we know what they were talking about but we've gotten ourselves we don't have all the information, you know, they were doing something very reasonable, but in our minds, it was something wrong, but so did we get the facts right? And is it, um, are you coming from a heart of loving kindness? And the fourth one is, are the words gentle? That was there yeah. as well, Pia, must be Pia Raja. There's Raja, actually five. Yeah. There's five, yeah. yeah. What's the fifth I think one? the other one is, is it true? Is it true? Yes, yeah, said true. Yeah, five is it right? right? Yes. True, true? beneficial. It... Ah, beneficial. That's right. Beneficial. Is it beneficial? Is it beneficial? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, Pia Vacha, if it's Pia Vacha, I think the literal meaning is loving words. Yeah, loving, Pia. So it's, it's different. Cool. Yeah. But it's, it's more like endearing. Yeah, I would have thought it was Pia, but anyway, yeah. it must be a yeah. derivation. Mm. What are some concrete beneficent conducts besides loving, kind speech and generous acts to others? Listening mm. to others. Mm. Concrete beneficent conducts. I mean, it's the precepts. It's the opposite of the precepts. Protecting life, being gentle towards life, um, mm. revering life. Uh, it's actually so what are the, all the there, precepts? There are the, 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 the opposite. Yeah, yeah. then the yeah. giving, but that's the Generous, giving. Generous, open-handed, and delight in sharing. And then the other one was this. The third one was... Um, Being trustworthy. For example, the opposite of um, sexual misconduct is being trustworthy. Being somebody that people can... Um, yeah, you do what you say you'll do. <laughs> you keep your promises, right? This is also part of right speech, but uh, to be loyal, to be trustworthy, to be committed. Uh, what are the other precepts? Not what to one? take, we said. And then the, and then the speech. But speech. she's saying besides speech and besides generosity. So, but there's different kinds of speech. There's not just loving speech. There's also speech that doesn't waste people's time. So speech that is worth listening to, which is worth recording, which is focused on the Dhamma. Um, which is beneficial for others, speech which is gentle, as we said. <clears throat> um, what are the other types of speech? My, I'm very tired today, so I can't think too much. But yeah, I mean, I think you know it in yourself, don't you, when you're doing something that's beneficial. First of all, it should be coming from a good motivation, a motivation of loving kindness, compassion, mm. um, non-possession, non-self non in a way. I mean, one of the parts I'd like to draw attention to in this is that um, is the impartiality, mm -hmm. which is really interesting. And I think if that wasn't there, that endearingness and that embracing mm -hmm. could be very selective. Right. It could be very preferential. Mm -hmm. But the fact that this is something that we do impartially, whether or not we particularly like a person, whether or not we 
kind of have the same views or um, the same background or race or whatever, same sexuality, um, we can be impartial because all beings suffer. So where are the distinctions really? They're very minor. Um, and in that way, we can endear anybody to us. I mean, the Buddha was the Buddha because he was able to behave this way towards everybody. And um, what else does it say? Something else about impartiality here. It just repeats the word impartiality. Right. Yeah. Can I say about you? Um, yeah. Can I just finish yeah. my train of thought? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> mm. I need time. Mm. Oh, go for it. <laughs> Where it just struck me about impartiality is that we take ourselves so personally and we take other people so seriously, and everyone is so, you know, solid mm. uh, and uh, a person that has. Uh, you know there are there there is there an ego and we so don't want to damage that and we don't want to upset that ego we don't want to um we we want to protect their their sense of self and so all this going around beating around the bush is just to make sure people's egos don't get damaged <laughs> isn't it but if really that that's it you don't want to, oh they'll get upset but it, it's an ego that's getting upset but anyway when you recognize for yourself that that's all you're doing you're you're propping up someone's ego usually our own actually isn't it yeah because we don't want to be the true, one that true, upsets true, someone true. else true we want true. to be the good person true, the true, one that true, says whatever true, everyone true, wants to true, hear true, and that says true, yes yes true. i can keep talking and ask me another question yes. <laughs> yeah. because uh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. about popping up our egos. A lot of it. Yeah. So I find recognizing that, mm. that's what I'm doing. I'm popping up my ego and I'm helping that person prop up their ego. Mm. Mm. Uh, just recognizing said, why am I going into this? <laughs> I'm, yeah, just to make someone's ego feel safe or whatever. I mean, to some degree, you have to do that. Yeah. You have to do that. But um, you question what the essentials are Right. Grace says here, yeah, it makes you question what is essential in a relationship. Mm. <laughs> so that, now, yeah, I don't know if that ties in with impartiality, but uh, uh, yeah, because we're all, we're, we're, I don't know, we're all just non-self, so. <laughs> mm. Anyway. That's something I find very useful when it comes to relating to other people. Mm. That uh, there's actually nobody there. We're just busy propping up this non-existent sense of self and uh, spend a lot of energy trying to keep it afloat, ours and others. Uh, what a waste of time. <laughs> anyway. So, and... Um, that's uh, and the, the other one was beneficent conduct I don't know what's meant by does anyone know the Pali for beneficent conduct beneficent conduct beneficent conduct someone anyway conduct that's beneficial yeah that's it okay Kusala yeah. maybe hmm so yeah, conduct that's beneficial, conduct that is uh, um, worthy of being a human being, mm -hmm. worthy of your um, your your precious human life. So yeah, sometimes we're just <clears throat> yeah, and showing your care and showing your metta through action, isn't it? Atacharya. Mm -hmm. Oh, worthy, worthy, yeah. worthy conduct, something like that. <coughs> yeah, that's what you mm. said, actually, worthy of a human life. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm. So it's showing your love, you know, through your action, because it's easy to say, oh, I love you. I care for you. I miss you. Mm. You know, some people say this and they and then they're not really there for you. They don't show mm. it. And it just becomes empty words. It becomes a kind of sentiment. But people, there are other people who won't say that, mm. you know, and especially actually in, in certain types of relationships, say a teacher student relationship would never talk about love in the worldly sense, but the love is an unconditional kind of giving. And it's, it's an action that actually tries to free beings from suffering. Right. So on the spiritual path, we show our love, so to speak, through trying to, um, yeah, help alleviate the suffering, not only of those we care about, but, you know, of all beings, because we care about the fact that people are suffering. Mm. Um, so I think beneficent conduct is anything that um, helps alleviate that. Mm. Um, at least it's motivated to. And of course, it includes wisdom because you have to know right whether that conduct is really um, helping or perhaps coming from the wrong place, perhaps coming from, you know, wanting to... Um, endear yourself to somebody mm. for a certain benefit <laughs> which is where the impartiality is important again because if you want to sort of endear yourself to some people but not others it could be that you have motives or agendas you know um you want to get something out of it whereas when somebody gives and uh, is kind to all beings then you know there's no personal motive mm. they're not invested in you know what they get or they're not invested in any one particular person mm. yeah Okay. Mm. appreciation acceptance caring all of that yeah but I think the conduct is talking about actual physical acts mm. you know physical ways to look after each other like for example somebody came to the monastery today and they hadn't been before but they brought all these little buddha statues and it wasn't about the statues it was the fact that these belonged to this person they were part of a collection that he'd been um you know lovingly putting together for years and he felt that he wanted to give them to a bikuni monastery to show his appreciation and support so it wasn't about the gift but it was the conduct it was the actual doing mm. something coming here to offer food it's a conduct you know you're mm. showing your care you're showing your support and mm. it's much more touching you know mm. like my first teacher going she used to say yeah, all everything starts in the mind, right? Our intentions, everything we do starts in the mind. We have to have the intention first. But when it becomes stronger, then it spills into speech. Mm. So the words, and then when it becomes stronger still, it it spills over into action, mm. you know. And I think that's one of the things people sometimes criticize um, some forms of Buddhism for. Um, they say, well, you know, maybe they chant, maybe they, you know, use the verbal speech to try and alleviate suffering. But what do they actually do? You know, do they go out and alleviate poverty? Do they go out and, you know, feed the homeless and all the rest? And of course, not everybody can do everything, right? But it's sometimes not enough just to say something to another person. You need to actually do something mm -hmm. as well, a little act of service. Mm -hmm. And that's how monasteries work, you know. So the fact that someone will make you a cup of tea when you've forgotten to make one for yourself or you're feeling really tired or, you know, they'll they'll give you some practical advice on something or actually do a task to take mm. it off your shoulders. Um, mm -hmm. This is really nice. Yeah. yeah. Actually doing yeah. something. Mm. Because that it does involve a bit of sacrifice. Mm. Like that was what was touching today, that this person had not only given, but they'd sacrificed in the giving. Mm. Mm -hmm. you know they're given something up mm -hmm. it wasn't just they'd gone to the shop and mm -hmm. I mean that's already wonderful because you're giving up your time and your hard-earned money or whatever mm -hmm. gently earned money but he'd sacrificed something that was dear to him mm -hmm. which was beautiful mm -hmm. <laughs> should we do the next one okay yeah keep it and is, did anybody have anything to ask or say or no okay Okay, so we'll keep going. Yes. Okay. So next one is um, a section called Sustaining Community. The first section was the formation of community. Now it's Sustaining Community. Okay. Mm -hmm. Aha. Right. The standard of authority. The Brahmin Vasakara, Chief Minister of Magadha, Ask the Venerable Ananda, 
is there, Master Ananda, any single monk who was appointed by the Buddha thus? He will be your refuge when I am gone. And whom you now have recourse to? There is no single monk who was appointed by the Blessed One thus. He will be your refuge when I am gone. And when and whom we now have recourse to? But is there, Master Ananda, any single monk who has been chosen by the Sangha and appointed by a number of elder monks thus, he will be our refuge after the Blessed One has gone and whom you now have recourse to. There is no single monk who has been chosen by the Sangha and appointed by a number of elder monks thus, he will be our refuge after the Blessed One has gone and whom we now have recourse to. But if you have no refuge, Master Ananda, what is the cause of your concord? We are not without a refuge, Brahmin. We have a refuge. We have the Dhamma as our refuge. You say, Master Ananda, that you have the Dhamma as your refuge? How should this be understood? Brahmin, the Blessed One prescribes the course of training for monks and has laid down the Pati Mukha. On the Uposatha days, as many of us live in dependence upon a single village district, meet together in unison. And when we meet, we ask one who knows the Pati Mukha to recite it. If a monk remembers an offense or a transgression while the Pati Mokha is being recited, we deal with him according to the Dhamma in the way we have been instructed. It is not the worthy ones who deal with us. It is the Dhamma that deals with us. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's hard. Because all of us like to have some kind of person that we seek refuge is and we want to have someone we can just hang off and you tell me what to do <laughs> and I'll just do it but this makes uh, you know we like to have a god <laughs> nah <laughs> I don't like you don't like to have a god it would be nice to have a god who just tells us I don't know no yeah. I don't like that <laughs> I like to do my thing. <laughs> I'm good. This is my top motivation. It helps with a lot of situations, but in, in, in situations, interactions, peace. Yeah. The Dhamma lives on when people come and go. Mm. And Dhamma lives on and people come and go. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's principles yes. of nature. Mm. It's um, principles of nature, isn't it? Mm. It's cause and effect. It's a mm. process that will remain timeless. That's why one of the qualities of the Dhamma is akalika, timeless. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you can come and see it yourself, the Buddha mm. said. So it's available to be understood. Mm. Whether or not there's anybody, mm. you know, even proclaiming it, it's possible to mm. observe laws of nature within ourselves right of course we can observe the laws of nature outside externally but to actually observe the laws of nature inside mm. so to look inside and know what's beneficent conduct for example by the results it gives mm. to the heart like you know whether something's come from the right place or it's been mm. mixed motives and mm. you know it may have different results not always mm. But you know in yourself, don't you, whether you've kind of uh, lied to yourself about that. So mm -hmm. we have this amazing innate ability as human beings to know what's uh, what's right and what's wrong, what's ethical and what's not, what's mm -hmm. harmful and what's not, because we're the first people to be harmed. You know, if we think uh, on charitable thoughts towards another person, we really don't feel good about ourselves. There's some struggle. There's some inner struggle in our mind. It's like, oh, but they did this, but why did they do that? And we kind of wrangle with it, isn't it? 
Um, but then when we just understand, oh, okay, that happened because the person was maybe deluded or they were struggling with something. And basically because we're suffering, because we've lost the path at that moment, then, you know, there can be a lot more understanding and acceptance. Mm. So, yeah, peace is one of the qualities of the Dhamma, of course. It's uh, mm. the quality of Nibbana, actually. Mm. The highest peace, the highest mm. happiness. So anything that leads to happiness, right? Uh, the Buddha actually said, how can you know it's the Dhamma? How can you know it's the Vinaya? Because it leads to peace. It leads to insight, mm -hmm. abhinya, like deep knowledge. It leads to sambodhi, which means enlightenment and nibbana, things fading as well. And a kind of turning away, a kind of disengagement from the world. So this is how you can know it's the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. And disengagement doesn't mean you don't act in the world, but it means you're not so much clinging to the things that happen. Mm. Yeah. I guess the thing about we were saying the other day when Olivia was here, mm. that uh, the good thing about studying the Dhamma is that you don't have to in discover it for yourself, you know, spend a lot of a lot of suffering going, oh my God, why didn't someone tell me that all this time? <laughs> Hmm. when you're suffering so that's the the beauty of learning the dhamma you know learn for example that having angry thoughts is suffering having thoughts that uh, you know having saying mean things is suffering so hmm. it's great to actually learn that because uh, some of us are slow learners and it's you know we, we might have parents who didn't particularly tell us that mm -hmm. so that's the that's the that's the greatness of having access to the dhamma that we learn these principles right they're in 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 lists we can read and go okay <laughs> that's a that's that's a good idea to follow that one right yeah yeah, yeah. i mean i actually came in it the other way I came with it through the practice and then only learned those things oh. in the context of meditation. So mm -hmm. I think it has to be both. It like on the one both. hand, yeah. it's good to see those, but actually yeah. you can get to that through the practice with good teachings. You know, say in a retreat situation where you are just sitting with yourself and you're watching your mind and what it's doing and, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's leading you to peace or whether it's leading mm -hmm. you to entanglement in your own mind and the way you're reacting to sensations in your mm -hmm. body. Right? You can easily see the difference between reacting with aversion mm. and just like investigating whatever's arising mm. and, and taking an interest in it and, uh, you know, remaining mm. uh, curious about the experience. There's, there's a big difference. One leads to suffering and one leads to a kind of untying mm. of that suffering. So I think, um, yes, the Dhamma's in books, but ultimately it's inside. We ha It has to be internalized. Mm. You know, that's where the actual benefit comes um, and I think that's the difference between the Buddha as a teacher or as maybe what's been preserved, uh, the teachings of the Buddha that's, that have been preserved compared to uh, the teachings of other religions, which do come across more as lists of do and, do's and don'ts. Because I actually think most people know not to be hungry. They know not to say drink alcohol or take drugs. But it's the how to not do that that we don't have. So for me... Buddhism if anything like is more than a philosophy or a religion it's a path it's something we can actually walk on mm. you know and put into practice mm -hmm. there's a kind of how-to mm -hmm. manual mm -hmm. and you have to actually use the you know it's good to read the manual but if you don't actually mm. uh I don't know it's like reading the manual of how to make a cupboard you can know how to do it but until you've actually done it you don't really know what it means um and you don't have a cupboard either Mm. <laughs> but you still need the manual uh, I think so it helps it helps Yeah. You, I mean it totally you need yeah. some teachings yes. totally yes. but what I'm yes. saying is that um, that alone won't do it yeah it just yeah. won't it won't change the habit patterns of the mind no of course own. not no of course not mm. yeah I'm I'm just thinking, I guess there there are sadly, you know, if you're born to a family of, of mm. the whole family, you know, drug dealers or whatever, mm. 
you just don't have that in your psyche yeah you don't have that uh, mm. ethical conduct as part of your um yeah. you, 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 it doesn't quite click that it's not a yeah yeah you yeah, certainly um, we need examples that's yeah. right but I still think there's something in the human heart that knows. Yeah, deep down, deep, deep, deep down, deep down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we do yeah. know that it, it's yeah. not quite right. Yeah. Hi, Diana. Nice to see you. Um, Sarah's asking, what is the main manual for Buddhists? So uh, the Buddhist teachings are in the Sutta Pitaka, which are the Majima Digga, basically the middle, the long, the short <laughs> length discourses and uh, the connected discourses and the numerical discourses. So there are, uh, you can Google that easily and find what they are. And uh, yeah, I mean, this book is compiled from those suttas. So these kind of anthologies are much easier sometimes mm -hmm. to make a start with because they're themed, you know, according to certain topics that might be of interest um another one that's an anthology is in the buddha's words i think mm. uh which is slightly bigger and that has a lot of uh other suttas that are grouped according to themes. particular themes including stories of the buddha's life as well like sort of autobiographical or not autobiographical mm. but biographical um stories of the buddha's life and then of course his main teachings and that's also about being yeah. the body yeah yeah okay. you can look them up you can look them up online so uh, Sean says, to me, it's very subtle and involves a lot of skillfulness to be that aware. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It does. But um, we can develop our subtlety and our skillfulness, right? It's not that we don't have it. It's just that we haven't trained it yet. Um, and, you know, sometimes we train it and then sometimes we become coarse again because the activities of life are kind of coarse and, you know, we move out into the world and we lose that connection with what's going on inside, but, but it's always there to return to. So it's just a matter of training our mindfulness on, on our inner world. Um, and the mind by itself becomes more subtle, especially when there are no distractions and you just have you know immersion in a retreat situation that's why retreats are so powerful and you can come out of retreat afterwards you might not feel like you've been meditating particularly deeply but then you realize gosh I just don't do those things that were harming me anymore like in my case I just didn't care anymore about going to parties or not that I did a lot of it at all but still it was like there was no urge for it there was no and I didn't want to kind of spoil the equanimity and the peace in my mind by even engaging in too much listening to music, even though it's not wrong, it was like, I don't want to agitate my mind because I enjoy that subtlety. I enjoy that kind of awareness that I can have just by being present to whatever's around me, you know, um, and not escaping all the time. I actually found, I guess that was what it was. I didn't need the escapes or the distractions so much anymore. So yeah, it becomes a fascinating process. So it's not just that it's hard. I mean, it's hard in the beginning, but I think the more you get into it and the subtler the mind gets, the more fascinating it becomes because you start to see the subtleties as well. And um, I mean, on my retreats, it's why I'm a nun. I actually, uh, it's why I took ordination, let's say, renounced, because I just felt more and more fascinated. I didn't want to stop the process. <laughs> mm. Yeah, Yay, we get to hear from Diana now. Diana, can you unmute, please? Yes, I've unmuted. I'll lower my hand. <laughs> Hi, Venerable Chanda. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hello, Venerable Upeka. It's nice to see you both. I missed last week, and I'm sorry I'm late today. I'm taking a desert plants Zoom six-week course, so they overlap. But last time I was here, we were on page 113, and now we're on page 116. And I see on page 114 that there was a section called like attracts like. And yeah. I'm wondering if it'd be okay if I asked a question about that. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, in this section and also was treated in the one right above, beings come together because like attracts like. And that's interesting to me uh, 
for many reasons. One of those is when I was young and learning about macrobiotics. My teacher said to me when he caught me eating a croissant, <laughs> yin craves yin. Yeah. So I guess that's a universal principle applied to many things in life. And here the Buddha is talking about how we come together with people that are like us naturally. But what about when we come together, perhaps by accident, perhaps not, with people who are turn out to be unlike us? In other words, we, uh, what does it say first? Well, you think somebody is one way and then they turn out to be another and they're not like you and then you're involved and you're twisted up and then you've got to get out of it. Is there any uh, treatment of that situation or guidance that you would be able to offer? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, to find this kind of guidance and to get the context of what the Buddha is talking about, mm -hmm. we need to read widely. Um, so the thing that sticks, that comes into mind now is just how the Buddha said, it's actually from the, um, is it the Sutta Nipata where he says, you know, if you don't find one equal or better, then it's better to walk alone. Um, and I think that is probably true in the case of, say, people that we associate a lot with, you know, people who are actually intimate with us, like spiritual friends or close friends that we choose. Um, because obviously we're not always going to meet other people on the path. And in our role, like as um, monastics, most of the time we're meeting people who are maybe just starting on the path or maybe who haven't, you know, got their sealer together yet. And if we just said, well, sorry, you know, you're not as like holy as me. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> that wouldn't give us much scope for growing and it wouldn't give anyone else much help either. Um, so I think it's probably a matter of how far we associate with people, you know, I mean, here the, the, the Buddha's talking about specifically about how to form intentional community. So intentionally we come together with like-minded people because we share the same values. You know, that's why Buddhist monasteries attract other Buddhists or people that are interested in Buddhism. Um, and then we have certain principles that we follow together, but I think in relationships where it's less balance say and where one is uh you know not maybe i don't know as virtuous as we are or we're not as virtuous as they are um it, it depends whether they're bringing you down and it depends if they're doing that over time because sometimes the opposite side is you can influence another positively and i think where there's a possibility for that it's good to stay or at least maybe they're not your you know, they're not your spouse or something because you want to marry someone or if you want to marry someone uh, who's an equal, who's a partner, right? Who has strengths that may be different from yours, but still you have similar, you know, qualities. Um, but otherwise I think, yeah, sometimes we can influence people who don't have certain qualities to be more like us or vice versa, right? But then if you're in a relationship with someone and it's actually bringing you down and it's actually sort of maybe gaslighting or, um, you know, abusing um, and harming you, then I'm pretty sure that the rest of the Buddha's advice is to is to walk away. You know, he doesn't say just stay if a situation is harmful. He actually says leave it, whether that's a monastery where the wholesome qualities are not increasing or whether that's the relationship, you know he would say, you know, it's compassionate to you <laughs> to walk away. So compassion shouldn't only go to the other person. And I mean, I, I've been in situations, especially in my leadership role, where, you know, there are people that I can see are troubled. And my instinct is to help and to really try and support them at first. But after a while, I realize not only is it getting me down, um, sometimes it doesn't help them because it's not the right mm -hmm. kind, it's not the kind of help they need. So you're not necessarily doing people a favor, mm. even if you're well-intentioned by staying in something that's not um, mm. healthy, mm. I think. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Did you want to, I don't know if that really answers the precise point, but. Um, so it's a wonderful answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
can get together with like-minded people it's wonderful yeah. I mean that's why we sort of start monasteries really to make places where obviously we'll all be different and it's great if we are because then we can learn from one another's strengths and weaknesses and mm. support each other in that but um generally you know people are kind of on the same path or they're trying to you know, they've got an inclination towards service mm. towards solitude as well so mm one of the joys actually mm. of starting a place mm. yeah otherwise mm. you know we, we have to just mm. go to places that are already established but we can start our own uh, little mini places too even as lay people you can invite mm. some people around and mm. meditate together or mm. listen to a talk together mm. uh, yeah mm. I'm very happy in our community that people are doing that together mm. not only with the monastics in the center <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we went back to that one we've only got another 10-15 minutes so I, I think if anyone has more questions or, or things they'd like to share about their lives like maybe there's something here that's I don't know that you'd like to share or that you're struggling with in your life that's maybe you think is related or not directly related um, or anything about practice that you'd like to explore it's a good opportunity to do that i don't know which page we're on 16 yeah okay nikki's got something <laughs> cool uh, nikki can i ask you to unmute please unmute done it <laughs> oh i hope this comes out all right my words are really muddled with lack of estrogen too so <laughs> um i get embarrassed because it's recorded i think god i don't know i'd never listen to myself again <laughs> um there was oh so i've been listening to a lot of talks uh, i have done for a few years and i'm really drawn to i don't know so let me see if i can say this so if somebody's experienced um trauma whatever that looks like uh i think probably because i'm becoming more aware of this it feels like sometimes there's two parts of me there's sometimes the part of me that responds from the trauma and the part of me that responds from if you say like nikki that is the person that i would be if i hadn't gone through those experiences um and I'm no, I'm not the only one, you know, and I get that, and it's not about that, is it? But there's this um it makes it very difficult for me to go out into places where there's people. I think I just feel scared all the time. I think I feel scared of people generally. So I'm okay in one-to-one -one situations, but when I sort of go out, it's it gets becomes very frightening. Um, and I wasn't aware of that. I just thought people were horrible and I thought but it was my mind telling me like this angry frightened mind that like everyone's out to get me I don't think it is that <laughs> I think that's what I'm trying to say is that I'm because I don't think it's personal anymore Wonderful. yeah I just like, I don't really know what to do with that so I'm just gonna it's like I it's like it's a bit weird because I'm, I've got a friend who I keep saying this to, and bless him, he doesn't know what I'm talking about. I think. So, so I'm sort of trying to talk about this deep stuff, and it's like he it's like, looks at me, he goes, "What are you on about?" It's even when that's when you said about like attracts like. I had a really vivid memory about. I think someone said used that really horribly to me once. You know, like like really negatively. Oh yeah, you like you know, it's if I was in a like particularly in a dangerous situation from past life like um it was i'd attract i'd attract the abuse so that that's what came to my mind when i heard that and i thought yeah it's it's you know it's, and I'm, I'm very pleased i'm in a safer place than them but i can see how words you know can be very powerful that was from years ago i remember that so i think i probably just wanted to say that rather than ask a question i don't know what the question is really but um yeah i think the question is what do i do with that 
That's amazing, Nikki. <laughs> oh, I said, did that make sense? Oh, that totally. Sense. I mean, to actually be able to realize that, you know, your response to the world is trauma based. It's not your fault. It's based on things that are real that have happened to you, that anybody would respond that way. And, you know, rather than that the whole world's out to get you and that people are awful because many people who are still stuck in their trauma do feel that way and it's understandable you know because how do you know whether somebody else is going to do the same thing especially if it was somebody close to you that maybe abused you then why wouldn't anyone else so of course it, you know whatever we experience in our life gives us a perception a view of the world so if we've suffered you know a lot of cruelty or, or unkindness then for us the world is unkind the world is our experience our experience is the world right so the fact that you can see that yeah your whole world view is changing mm -hmm. is is to me sounds like very powerful healing actually mm -hmm. very powerful healing i guess if you're saying you don't know what to do with it i would just suggest to be very gentle because you know the old trauma will keep will come up sometimes and maybe cause you to doubt that again and think no actually maybe they are all horrible mm -hmm. so just very gently let people in and very gently maybe go to places where you know you're in around more people at a time mm -hmm. and maybe with people that you are actually mm -hmm. close to you know go with a best friend or something um and you don't have to either you know yeah. it can <laughs> it can even be just that shift inside so yeah. I think that sounds really wonderful and hopefully quite a relief yeah. for you. Yeah, brilliant. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I wish I was there, it's just sort of, but you know, thank you. Well, right now you are. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I think it's good that you didn't travel so many hours on the roads, actually. It's exhausting. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So we'll come to Sean just as the last uh Last person before we end. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, my has been a bit, so if I drop out. Um, so yeah, it was just two things I wanted to to bring up. One was something that happened today. Um, was that I had a situation where I my reaction was I didn't feel the per it was at work. This person are more senior to them, and I felt that potentially they weren't respecting what I was saying and maybe didn't trust in me. And my reaction was, well, you're more junior, I've got more experience, et cetera, et cetera. And it just popped into mind the, um, so I'm reading also the, the book on the disciples, was it the great disciples of the Buddha? When Sariputta, um, a child, pointed out to him that one of his robes, <clears throat> excuse me, wasn't tucked properly or something. And he very humbly sort of said, thank you, Ajahn. Um, and it, it kind of just made me think, wait a minute, am I reacting here? Is this my ego? And also, is there an element of truth in the reaction of that person? And it just kind of let took me out of the situation and it just gave me a little bit of insight. Uh, and really, I just thought I'd share that because it was just one of those moments. It was almost a bit like, aha, I'm caught up. Um, and, and so I just I thought it was quite a nice moment. What I also just wanted to mention was I found that since I've um, more so been coming to these things and since November, etc., I I've, I've, have what you were saying, withdrawn more from those normal distractions. And I felt that um, I'm... I felt there's been a lot of suffering actually there's there's been a lot of up and downs and I think it might just be that I'm more aware and I'm less distracted and because I've taken a lot of my distractions out I don't have a way of blocking it out absolutely I was just wondering if you've got any recommendations I, I wonder whether I've done a bit too much too quickly as well it's um uh or whether it's just part of the process and I guess you know everyone's different so it's for me to work it out partly as well I don't know if you've got any comments on that uh or any uh yeah suggestions really um yeah uh, yes 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 I agree with everything I think it's part of the process I think it's true that you were probably suffering even more before uh there were maybe even more ups and downs that we just 
instinctively respond to by distracting ourselves or by pushing it away through overeating or binging on whatever internet or youtube or and this is why monastic life some people were saying one time it must be much easier than being a lay person uh -uh. because you're taking away the distractions and and to the point where you cannot go and do those things i mean you wouldn't just plunge straight into it but you actually give up money you give up being able to drive you can't go anywhere you can't go for a coffee or you can't watch telly you know um so you have to be really used to your own mind and working with your own mind because you're not going to get away from it you know in monastic life and you'll be called to be in the public eye and to be around people and you know when you're not feeling like doing that and um you know you you need to be relating always on along the principles of dhamma so yeah i do think that um when we start to practice i've had the same experience i can start to feel that oh maybe my emotions are even more like not even more but you know maybe they're more kind of up and down or maybe um yeah like I notice all these tendencies that I didn't see before Mm -hmm. and you can feel you're regressing but it's actually a massive progress to start to see the way we tick it's a massive progress it's the stuff that's you know covered over for most of us and it's one of the reasons many people don't want to go on retreat they're too scared about you know having to confront that so it's great um I do think it's possible on the spiritual path to go too quickly and to do too much at once but I don't think my instinct is and I don't know you well but that that's probably not the case for you because I think you're very reflective I think you have um, a very integrated life and you know work life family life um and you're you know reading the suttas so you're you're trying to really understand the the foundations of the practice and yeah even the venerable sariputta is becoming your teacher today (laughs) so i think that's not yeah i think in your case it's it's wonderful um you know you're making a regular practice and uh, making sure it involves service as well so to me that's integration yeah um you know maybe don't go on a two-month retreat next time but i don't think you will i don't <laughs> think you're like that no, yeah. <laughs> so what does this mean you have to read shampoo bottles in your board on retreat oh yeah 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 <laughs> yeah 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 you end up reading all the small things on everything it's really a phenomenon <laughs> all the ingredients (laughs) medicine bottles (laughs) yes Yes, it's a phenomenon that's a phenomenon otherwise you create stories about you know i don't know the person sitting next to you what maybe they're like and what they do and what you think about them (laughs) yeah Yeah. the mind will you know it'll do its thing i start talking to trees do you start talking to trees? Yes. Oh, really? What do you say to the tree? I, I have, I have long conversations. Oh, really? That's so sweet. Yeah. <laughs> do they answer? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so nice. It's true, though, you know, I mean, I, I can laugh at that, but I was talking to all my animals on my six-month retreat. I was talking to the birds. They had names. I mean, I talked to my lizards. I talked to the kangaroos. I mean, they knew my voice. You know? I mean, they knew me. They used to come close, actually, on purpose sometimes, which was really sweet, especially when the male was, like, around. One time I was coming back to my cootie, and the kangaroo was quite close to the cootie, so I expected that as I was coming back, it would move away because usually that's what happened. And to my amazement, I was walking up to the cootie. They came closer. And then I realized it's because there was a male somewhere nearby and they were glad that I was back and they just wanted to like, it was mm. so sweet. It was mm. so sweet. They're coming in. Mm. <laughs> Especially mm. the one with the baby mm. that was uh, Tawny. Yeah, Tawny, Fawny and Newborny. There were three of them. Yeah, <laughs> I could recognize the different faces. I had a whole family there. There were the Big Ears family as well. And there were the like starry Stella, and they had the little white bit. So I had my family. So yeah, we're all a bit mad, really. But you don't, you know, take yourself so seriously either. And you just, yeah, you just find connection everywhere.
<laughs> all right that's too much disclosure isn't it but there we go you're all very open with us so we've been open with you <laughs> so um i don't know does someone want to speak <laughs> they either have um, to do it or not yes um yeah today so the discussion is offered on a donation basis as you know it's in the part of the generosity and uh, the contributions that you are, you you will be able to make are very gratefully received, and will help to support the day-to-day -day running of the Vihari in Oxford and the development of England's first monastery where women can train towards full Bhikkhuni ordination. And I will put a, a link about the donations, and not only the donations. If you are capable. You can provide a food dana to venerables by visiting the Vihara. And if you are not able to visit the Vihara, also there are several more other ways to get involved. Um, there is supermarket deliveries. Uh, there are also a couple of groups, WhatsApp groups to provide food when no booking is made. Um, if you are able, you can volunteer for one of work at Vihara. Um, uh, so I'm going to put a an email team at anukampa.org so you can contact them if you if you think that you can help and then they will guide you uh, and there are there are several events uh, we keep updating in the events page in the uh, in the anukampa bikuni website you can see them and uh, we also update our facebooks thank you Yes, we had a wonderful trust meeting here, actually. Not really trust meeting, but a few volunteers as well, um, just last week. And Minori was here and some other people were here, and it was so lovely. I don't know. We have to do a bigger volunteer meeting sometime. It was a lovely day. We were talking all about um, kind action, giving rather than hoarding, and simplicity, and so many things. And we all got so energized by the end of the day. It was wonderful. So yeah, we are starting to have more visitors. So hopefully some of you can come visit as well. Also, you can stay with us for some time if you wish. We're getting pretty full. So if you want to be here while the two of us are here, which is much nicer, um, then yeah. Either you have to come soon or else you have to lobby for Venerable Upeka to stay. I know which you prefer. <laughs> I say nothing. <laughs> Okay, but it's up to you. <laughs> All right, so we better let you go. And uh, thank you very much for being pretty awesome and uh, for all your support always. It's really heartwarming, really heartwarming. Yeah. I mean, it's why we're here, you know. Take care, everyone. We can unmute you or you can unmute yourself, maybe.